Hello and uh, welcome to a new uh, episode of the podcast series from the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden. Uh, my name is Hussein Askari. Today is July the 4th, 2023. By the way, congratulations to our friends in the United States uh, for the National Day. Uh, uh, the year 2023 uh, marks the 10th anniversary of the launching of the Belt and Road Initiative. And this has been an important theme of our activities. Uh, but also tomorrow, the 5th of July, marks the 10th anniversary of the launching of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is des described as the flagship of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the Memorandum of Understanding was signed on, as I said, 5th, July 5th, 2013. And the number of projects um, involved in the CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, is in the tens of large-scale infrastructure projects, which makes the CPEC the largest undertaking under the BRI. And this is uh, in the field, especially of the power generation, uh, transport, uh, 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 power transition, but also water and industrial and agricultural uh, projects. We will discuss this uh, with a special guest uh, from Pakistan, uh, Mr. Dr. Hassan Daoud. Uh, he's a, a former project director of the CPEC itself. He was one of the people who worked from the beginning on the CPEC. He's also currently associate professor of the Bahriya University in Islamabad. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Hassan, uh, and welcome to our show. Sorry, you are muted. So. Thank you very much. It's always uh, an honor to interact with you, discuss with you, and uh, share ideas and concepts with you. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And yes, this is this is a great milestone. We we are reaching 10th year of both the Belt and Road Initiative and CPEC. And I can also gladly say that both of us, you and myself, have been engaged with this these great initiatives for the region and beyond. So thank, uh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, it's a great honor for us to be to have somebody with your uh, background and knowledge and experience in this uh, area. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask you, uh, what does the CPEC mean for Pakistan? And what does it mean for China? Why is it so important? Okay, uh, it's a fantastic question. Let me take you back to 2013. So no, 2013 was an year where in Pakistan, we were having a lot of uh, terrorist-related incident. We were having scarcity of electricity. We used to have over 12 hours of load shedding in our urban centers and more so in the rural areas. So when, when CPAC and when the MOUs were signed, uh, for Pakistan, it meant uh, not just uh, the, the provision of electricity, but it also meant, uh, more interestingly, that the rural-urban connectivity and and regional integration would happen. And this was this was extremely important for us because Pakistan, because of various reasons, was sort of uh, in, a, in, a, in a situation where its economy was, uh, was deeply impacted by terrorism because of uh, insurgency. And therefore, our development uh, agenda could not be materialized. Each year, we used to have our, uh, our development plans, but still, those could not be initiated. So this was great. Uh, this was great for Pakistan, in, and also uh, great in terms of the narrative it wanted to build as a country which can host investment, which can have investment from energy to infrastructure development to optical fiber to to human development, and these were the areas where Pakistan was really interested. So for us, it was like uh, like jumping off from our seats uh, with with joy, a lot of pride, actually. And uh, and I'm sure you know the, the history of Pakistan-China relationship has been very strong. It has been on the strategic level. And this time we were entering into, into economic partnership. And this partnership is now translating in way forward into more business-to-business -business interaction and, uh, and looking at forging more uh, um, areas where cooperation can happen. So uh, this was this was quite interesting, and uh, it was perhaps for us one good news after several years of bad news. Yeah, there is a, the relationship between 
Pakistan and China is described as Iron Brotherhood. Uh, and also because since the probably the 50s, uh, although governments in Pakistan change sometimes in violent ways, but the relationship with China remains stable. And also the CPEC, despite the turbulence in Pakistan, changes of governments, but the CPEC continue to, to be built and work together. And that's very special. Absolutely. And that that is because of various reasons. Let me just uh, state a few. First of all, and the reason why it remains uh, at one point, one uh, convergence point between all our political party with varying national agenda and, and manifestos. So uh, for us, uh, each of our uh, parties, uh, irrespective of their a region that they represent. Uh, the economic development agenda remains paramount. And for them, one of the one of the uh, stepping stone for uh, for you know expanding export uh, and becoming part of the regional and global supply chain was through CPEC. And also the the political slogans around uh, CPEC were uh, were actually something which, be in, in not just in the academia and also in the think tank community, but also largely amongst the entire population we wanted to hear. We wanted to hear politicians speak about economic development and because on strategic level, this discussion used to happen on, on various agendas. Uh, but this time it was something involving people from both sides. And this was unique and interesting. And this is something which is unique and interesting for the Belt and Road Initiative also. Yeah. I, the, uh, the, the CPEC is also has a lot to do. I mean, it's incredible that the, there was a war going on in Afghanistan for the past 20 years, which it, enormous terrible consequences uh, for pa Pakistan itself. But despite that, you had problems in the Xinjiang province in, in uh, China, which was a, a spillover from this terrorist problem in all uh, West Asia, Central Asia, as a part of the war on terrorism. Uh, but then China managed to stabilize the situation in Xinjiang. But now Xinjiang, which is neighboring Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia, has become an important hub for the Belt and Road Initiative, the Iron Silk Road, and uh, for economic development, and also a strategic artery, you know, for uh, connecting to Eurasia. And uh, what do you think is in that sense, important for China to connect to Pakistan through that way from a strategic standpoint? Yes, uh, you know, for China, I think as a, as one of the largest economy, I think second in, in, in the overall global context, which I which I sometimes argue, I think there's uh, in terms of uh, power purchase parity, I think they are number one. And, and in terms of happiness, uh, index, I think I think they, they are by far better than any other nation in the world. So in that context, I think when China grows, I, it, especially for its neighboring countries, it, this is huge opportunity. But the best part is that when Chinese leadership, especially President Xi Jinping and in the entire leadership of the CPC, and by the way, we must congratulate CPC for its 102nd birthday also, which just happened two days back. So I, I, I think their agenda of, uh, of uh, social economic development for its people cannot materialize being an export-led country and, and uh, the entire economy and, uh, are centered around exports. I think for them to, to, to step out of, uh, of, of their regions and uh, normal comfort zone and look at markets and partners outside uh, their region was important. And I think for that, uh, Xinjiang was the right platform. And when you speak about Central Asian countries and the countries which are not just uh, landlocked, but double landlocked also, I, I think for them, this, uh, this entire uh, canvas of Belt and Road Initiative was very, very important. And interestingly, the, 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 uh, um, in, within the CARIC, uh, which is the Central Asian Republic Economic uh, Cooperation is uh, the headquarter of their CARIC Institute is based in Xinjiang. So Xinjiang is, is, is a platform historically also for, for trade and people interaction, but more importantly, it is now uh, 
a, a center point, a conduit for, for regional integration right from north to all the way to south in Gawadar. And this connectivity cannot happen without seamless trade, connectivity of policies, people-to-people -people interaction, and Belt and Road Initiative and, and its, uh, its components like the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor provides that input. So for Chinese uh, going forward, not uh, now, but in 2013, they were clear on their agenda. Now they're speaking about the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative. But in 2013, when Belt and Road Initiative came and, and I was fortunate to attend both the Belt and Road Forum in Beijing, uh, the discussion was always around, uh, around regional economic integration. Even I remember the former IMF uh, chief speaking about how Belt and Road Initiative supports SDGs development, sustainable development goals uh, development, and also the World Bank's and IMF agenda of economic integration. And even now, Bob, and I'm sure, Hussain, you've written a lot about this, uh, despite so many headwinds on uh, globalization after COVID and during COVID, I think the only ray of hope for me still remains the Belt and Road Initiative because of the integration potential it has, the economic integration potential it has. So I, I, I think only for, and people ask me this, this is a frequently asked question that perhaps China looks at Belt and Road Initiative for its own um, uh, reasons uh, uh, and it does not support the region as such. But I think for me, it, it, more than China, for developing countries of the region, even Afghanistan, I think this is this is one opportunity which we cannot miss. That's very well said. Uh, if we go down, to, uh, Afghanistan is going to be a very, very important issue, actually. We're not going to discuss it right now, but I think that the, the integration of Afghanistan into the Belt and Road Initiative, we have written about that, we have discussed that earlier, uh, is very, very important to stabilize Afghanistan and the uh, get rid of the old problem of extremism and, and violence. But uh, if we go down to the details of the CPEC itself, because as you said, uh, one of the major uh, is uh, issues was in Pakistan's economic problems is the lack of energy power. And this has been the main focus of the, of the CPEC. And uh, there are large scale investments. There are 16 major power production uh, projects involved uh, in hydropower, uh, solar power, wind power, coal power, but even nuclear power, which people don't often talk about. Uh, I mean, it's like one fourth of Pakistan's electricity is now provided by these projects. And uh, interestingly, uh, many of these projects are Chinese investments. These are not through loans. And uh, actually I wrote already back in 2017, 2018 about the debt trap Actually, in Pakistan, the debt trap was set up because of Pakistan's enormous need for credit to buy energy from outside, uh, which was the biggest the trade deficit uh, cause. And that has made Pakistan, even in your many of your industries, were not uh, functioning because of the lack of uh, power. Uh, so this uh, fills a huge gap in the development process in uh, Pakistan. We have in transport that 12 major highway uh, and road uh, projects. We have ports, uh, Gwadar port. You, you are very, very familiar with Gwadar. We I hope we could discuss that. We have airports. Uh, so many of these projects are actually investments, not loans. Uh, some of them are grants or gifts like the airport in Gwadar. So we also have the question of building of industrial zones, um, uh, special economic zones. We have agricultural cooperation, uh, cooperation and mining. You have enormous mining wealth, but it's not explored. So this is a very, very important. Uh, because we, without the infrastructure, it's impossible to develop the economy. So if you can give us an idea about the magnitude and importance of these, uh, especially the power projects. Yes, uh, wonderful. And I, I, there are two areas which are unique and using the opportunity of talking to you because you find new ideas and concept. I'll, I'll share two more ideas with you on this. So starting with the details on the projects, I uh, so far we have had around 6,000 megawatt of electricity projects undergoing different stages. Naturally, there are a few which are, but more importantly, what happened for Pakistan, and I'll give you these impressions on the sidelines also. 
you know what happened when we were doing these energy projects was that the pakistan's energy basket was transforming and because of this because of this because of the hydro projects and because of more importantly and now we see more discussions around them when we speak about greening of cpac and greening of diria you know what happened more importantly was that these projects started with uh, wind and uh, solar projects so the initial two uh, two or three projects so let's say around 100 to 200 megawatt of electricity was from solar and wind project so this was the first exposure that pakistani uh, pakistani energy sector expert got from foreign investment in 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 these projects we had solar but not in the wind so our wind corridors were utilized because of this and now we see more investment coming there so this was one uniqueness of of the cpac investment and then from there we graduated into into hydel projects and i know some of the some of the environmentalists are going to argue and we will have this is discussion uh going forward in this interview but then what the other unique aspect was the third core you know this this uh, the the natural endowment of coal for pakistan was discussed for last 70 years but it is it was only when the chinese came and invested and then we realized that the quality of coal is good and this is one of the unique open pit uh, coal mines that we have in the region so this again provided pakistan this energy secure security for using its own indigenous resources earlier we were importing and still we are importing huge amount of electricity and and electricity sources from outside you know fuel yeah, oil and oil and gas oil and, and the resources yes yeah. so most uh, some of the thermal projects are run by imported fuel so for that to transform into a basket where you can now speak about having 30% through renewables by 2030 is something which i call a gift of cpac for us and again from there now we were have we were able to have hydel projects and i was closely associated with sukki kanari with dasu with uh, with some other projects being the head of the board of investment in khaybar pakhtunkhwa which is the adjoining province with afghanistan so i can we can speak about the trade potential through bri also with afghanistan and beyond so this these these areas which were untapped and uh, outside the i mean the accessibility was a challenge now we are having dams and water reservoir projects being built through cpac so it addresses the the issues of uh, um, the flooding it uh, it addresses issues of employment in terms of energy projects it addresses issues of uh, environment at large because now we are talking about renewable projects so these areas which are pe which people are discussing now going forward uh here when they talk of net zero by 2050 the discussion initially started for us in 2013 when we were talking about the mou for energy and then going forward and this all happened uh, uh, dr hussain happened between 2013 to 2015 because you know and I, and you live in a uh, uh, you know in a country where you represent cross cultural the definition uh, you know you persona five cross cultural uh, definition so you know doing projects in a cross cultural environment is always a challenge because the working culture is different the language is different and in two years in pakistan we were able to embrace in energy sector alone um, as you mentioned about 16 projects and investment around 18 uh billion us dollars initially and then it graduated to 22 billion us dollar and as we speak we have projects of around 28 billion and then now Just again to coming one to... point you mentioned on cross cultural issues and language yeah. i was looking at pakistan's uh, you know you have a 249 million population maybe 250 now million people and the size of pakistan is almost as big as both germany and france together and the population is even twice as large as germany and france put together but also i discovered that there are 70 different languages in pakistan there are a dozen ethnic groups so this is not a simple issue uh, also you have these in those rural remote areas because the cpec is allowing 
to connect these rural areas to the centers of population and centers of urbanization, but also bring electricity, bring other services to that population. Uh, I mean, you were in the Khaybar uh, Pakhtunkhwa province, which is adjacent to Afghanistan and uh, with all the problems there, because one of the, the one major issue is the isolation of these areas and the lack of services became a, 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 a growth ground for uh, frustration in the population and security problems. So this is very, very important from all these different aspects. So uh, the, 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 the CPEC is helping solve all these problems. But as you said, you know, you yes. mentioned the yeah. fact that 2030 is the, you know, this is not the short term uh, project. This is a very long term project in a sense. Uh, but please go ahead. Yeah. And this and, and, and the discussion that we are having now on the on the rural urban synergy, and, and I'm I've been a big proponent of the fact that you know you can't just have economic growth unless you connect both the rural economies and the urban economies. And this is this is a classic example of how CPEC has helped us. And I'll give you one very simple example. There's a road connecting DI Khan with Islamabad. It is called as Hakla DI Khan Road. It is about uh, 200 kilometers plus road. It was built under the uh, uh, with our local investment plus the CPEC support. And 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 as as soon as that project finished, I saw about two billion US dollars worth of investment from Pakistani investors from Punjab moving to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa to DI. And this is and I. And, and uh, you know you can you can uh, use Chinese old saying by that if you want to become rich, build roads. And this is exactly how roads and infrastructure help. Again, when we were building our motorway in the eastern corridor between Multan and Sakhar, and building a corridor connecting to KKH, the areas those we were being connected were all less developed rural areas. And this connectivity, and I always say this to my students also, this connectivity, I mean, in one way, provides access of transportation, access of energy, access of markets. But it is more important for female population of those areas which have access to education, which have access to primary health care, because which perhaps were not there and now when you build road. And for poor farmers, it provides a great platform from connecting, uh, you know, their villages to markets, and from their farm to market. And this connectivity was provided. Connectivity is being or and was provided. And one more aspect, and I'm sure you'll be happy to hear. I did one research on on the uh, the relationship between security and infrastructure. And I must tell you, once the connectivity between Quetta to, to Gawadar was built through under the platform of CPAC, the terrorism institute in that area where those roads were built reduced many fold. At least 30% reduction in those times when 2013, when things were not as good as perhaps now. And so therefore, for us, the, the impact was not just on the socioeconomic part, but also on the security aspect also. Also connecting of new markets within Pakistan. And perhaps this, this formula, and I keep saying this and I've written a lot, in the Belt and Road uh, uh, Initiative, I always say that Pakistan remains the buckle of the belt. Because, you know, it demonstrates some of the main features which are the essence behind the Belt and Road Initiative. Poverty alleviation, rural urban synergy, connectivity of people, regions being connected through trade and business and through understanding. And then what happened, uh, Dr. Hussain, was that, you know, our quest for learning Chinese language and our quest for understanding Chinese culture grew. In universities, I see uh, the number of Confucius institutions and China Studies Center grew, especially in rural, uh, especially in urban universities. And I represent one university where we have our own Chinese study center. So for people to understand Chinese culture, which has a history of more than 5,000 years, 
was important and relating it to the trade and the old silk route was important. So, I mean, there, there are huge benefits uh, from that infrastructure and energy sector. And, and when we talk of energy, the other thing that we were lacking was, uh, Dr. Hussain, was, uh, was the fact that our grid was extremely poor. Our, um, our overall infrastructure of energy was extremely poor. So while you were investing, while the Chinese uh, thankfully were investing on generation, they were also investing on transmission. So right. we now have about 585 kilometers or rather 850 kilometers of transmission line will build, build under CPEC. And these are not simple transmission lines. These are HVDC transmission lines. Mm -hmm. So we were earlier having AC lines where the loss, uh, the energy losses were more. Yeah, now we this have DC was... lines. Yeah, I looked uh, recently at this, uh, uh, what do you call it? It's uh, uh, the dual trap of the in the electricity uh, the sector, because you have a, a you know, it's like a catch-22 situation where the, the cost of the energy production becomes much larger because of the transmission lines need uh, repair the whole time. They are old, uh, they are outdated. And even if you produce more electricity, the transmission lines don't help, and that yes. also increases the rate, rise, raises the uh, the rate of the electricity. But that also, on the other hand, uh, people and industries are not willing to pay for the electricity if it is not so uh, reliable. So you have this uh, double uh, situation where you know one problem leads to the other. But now with the adding the modern transmission lines to the production line, uh, and then the services will be uh, easier provided to the consumers and the consumers will have reliable electricity and therefore they will pay for the, uh, for the fees of the. You see, uh, let's take Gawada, for example. You know, we, for the entire district, for last 70 odd years, we were having only 10 megawatt of electricity. So how can you have economic growth in an entire district, which is a coastal district, and talk of large projects unless you have electricity? So when, because of CPAC, when Gawadar came into uh, the canvas of economic growth, because earlier, you know, the Western narrative of uh, string of pearls was there, but now from there to an economic growth agenda centered around connection between the Gawadar in the south to a Central Asian Republic in the north, the whole transformation of concept changed. And therefore, when Iran now provides us 100 megawatt of electricity for Gawadar alone, this is some of the some of the side effects that you have from the overall agenda around CPEC. Mm -hmm. And this is how now people, when, when they get exposure to projects, when they get exposure to Chinese or other investment coming in their way, their demand for growth, their demand for energy, and their demand as a right of access to electricity and even access to internet becomes important because one of the infrastructure projects that we did from CPEC was the optical fiber connectivity. Yeah, it's a 800, 1,000 kilometer fiber optic connection from China to Gwadar. So that... I always say now, that earlier the, the human rights or the right of human development was centered around shelter and food. But I think now it is centered around shelter, food, and internet. Yes. So, that so now with that, yeah. yeah, so with that, with that theme now, with having a, a roads, bridges, optical fiber, dams, mm -hmm. energy, um, renewable energy. And yeah. then, of course, from there, the socioeconomic agenda yeah. of having burn centers in five provinces, which are which is which has been approved, which has not been uh, you know executed because of COVID, unfortunately, because a lot of healthcare personnel of China and of course our domestic healthcare and activities were centered around uh, addressing challenges of COVID, but. You know, under the agenda, under the MOU, we have burn center in all our major provinces and along the coast, uh, along the Belt and Road uh, corridor. 
So these are some important points and now moving forward and we'll speak about this also. Yeah, the, I want the, just one uh, before we go to the future of the CPEC is because you said, you know, the, the CPEC is the buckle in the Belt and Road. Uh, because there's a very important concept which you refer to is that the Belt and Road is not simply about trade, that China wants to build trade routes to its markets. That's not really the whole issue. That's not the issue, really. But it's the question of economic development, building development corridors to raise the productivity of societies along the belt, which is based on building infrastructure. Uh, but also, I mean, the social effects. Uh, and uh, I would like to come back to this question of breaking the isolation of air, rural areas. But also, I mean, Gwadar is a very good example, you know, of a remote fishing village. Uh, what was the wisdom behind connecting the belt, the CPEC, not to Karachi, for example, which is already established as a port, but to Gwadar. But before we go there, uh, the question of, uh, for example, hydropower, uh, because we have seen flooding in Pakistan, disastrous flooding. We also have drought some years. So you have either drought or flooding uh, when the monsoon rain comes. But now with the hydropower, is that going to help also not only produce uh, clean energy, but also uh, help build irrigation systems, flood control systems, and that way increase the, uh, for example, afforestation, but also agricultural production in Afghanistan by transferring water to areas that are dry or you know, planting trees, uh, which was uh, one of the big projects. Yes, so, you know, Pakistan in, uh, and the the three aspect which I consider very important now, and perhaps as a, as an echo of history, I think the the three concept of geography, human human development or human potential, and of course the connectivity of both with the region is important. And you've you've had you've written a lot on this. There's a lot of literature available on how humans' ability to develop more has has actually grown manifold by its connection with the rest of the world and by exchange of people and uh, cultures. But on, on, the, on the environment side, I think Pakistan is, is, is amongst those countries. And unfortunately, the countries which are impacted the most uh, are the ones who do not have the resources to address these challenges of climate change and environment degradation. So for us, uh, you know, we need to take tangible steps to address this because last year and year before we have had series of devastation. And I, I believe the way that the um, uh, Mother Earth is reacting, I think moving forward, we will have more of these. So it, it gives, it addresses a, the challenges around water scarcity when you said drought and also, you know, availability of water not just for uh, agriculture and irrigation purposes, but also for drinking purposes for both humans and animals, which are part of the overall uh, you know, natural cycle. And then besides that, uh, the connection of this water reservoirs through, uh, say for example, Gawadar as an example, where certain water reservoirs were built, but their connection with Mayor and urban center was challenging areas where the Chinese came. Even in case of Gawadar, the, the desalination plant, for because when we started Gawadar, the overall water deficiency was around 6 million gallons per day, which is now about 2.3 million gallons per day because some of the desal plants have been built, A, for the port and also for the people in Gawadar, which addresses this. So, uh, and then again on the irrigation part, because this region uh, where I belong to is was known for its canal and irrigation system, but no progression was made and no progress was made. And today we are talking about Chashma right bank canal uh, and its connectivity with CPEC and its its water uh, reservoirs. So in that aspect, we were able to build. And also, uh, uh, Dr. Askari, you know the availability of roads in case of in case of any, any natural calamity is also important. So these infrastructure and roads were like, for example, Sawat, where we had extreme flooding, but the roads infrastructure under the umbrella of CPAC, not through Chinese investment, but our local investment, but under CPAC and its connectivity were built. So people 
were able to leave those areas in time because there was a good infrastructure available. So while these dams help, and they have their own ecological challenges, but in terms of uh, short-term and medium-term support to the overall environment and water-related uh, issues can be addressed through these and are being addressed through these. The other thing that it, it helps is, and of course, irrigation is we, we had a lot of deforestation. So when you have water and when you uh, have accessibility of that water to address uh, some of the plantation related areas. So now we are also talking about uh, forestation in the last four or five years, Pakistan has actually worked on uh, its overall quantum of forest that we have in, in our country. So, I, I mean, we can talk about areas and areas and folds after fold where CPAC has actually helped us. The other areas, area, and that this is this is extremely important when you talk of, and you spoke about special economic zones and and business related potential around CPEC. The other areas, area was that when Chinese investment came to Pakistan, lot of our weaknesses were also exposed for embracing investment, our capacity of uh, the stakeholders within uh, public sector, on private sector. So today there is a debate of setting up ease of doing business because of CPEC, and I always say this. There is a debate of setting up one window for Chinese and other investors because we were exposed towards our capacity to do business partnerships. And today, as opposed to 2013, I find Pakistan a better place for investment and its capacity to handle investment. So these are some of the, so the, there are, while there are tangible projects like dams and, you know, optical fiber and perhaps energy projects, these are certain intangible benefits that we have had and we must talk more about that also. You're muted. Very important point because you cannot build a modern infrastructure system where you have a, an outdated bureaucratic system. You cannot attract That's investment true. when the investor comes into the country and there's a hell waiting for them. Uh, but uh, one of the interesting things that uh, one of my uh, friends uh, uh, from the China Investment Research uh, uh, in, in England, Mr. Henry Tilban, he he follows the, uh, the, the levels of the small investments, but these are very important indicators. And he said that it's interesting that lots of non-Chinese foreign investors are coming to Pakistan because there are big opportunities there. These are not large scale, these are small scale in the marketing, in IT, in other uh, sectors. So because the environment changes, investors from other parts of the world, not only from China, will also want to come and uh, invest uh, in Pakistan, not only because you have a now uh, infrastructure and uh, you know labor force but also it's a big market 250 million people they need lots of services you need digitalization you need uh, digital marketing uh, systems all these things will be modernized uh, to match the development uh, so you're talking about the future of um, of uh, of the cpec now many people especially from outside pakistan say look the, the cpec has not delivered Pakistan is still a poor country. Uh, there's uh, unemployment, there's poverty, there's this and that, there's you know uh, all kinds of problems. And they think that, they, that the CPEC should have had like some magical wand that it would transform Pakistan immediately into a, an advanced, uh, uh, prosperous country. Uh, so I wanted to ask you what are the obstacles, but also what is the level of expectation because Pakistan has had like 40 years now of horrible uh, situation, security, uh, other you have failed economic policies. You had policies imposed by the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, you know, we, that needs to be addressed too, because one of the things I saw in 2018 when uh, Pakistan was negotiating with the World Bank and IMF, they, they ordered Pakistan to remove 200 billion rupees in investments in infrastructure if they wanted to get help from the IMF. So how you can solve economic problems if you don't invest in infrastructure? So this has been uh, one of the other issues, but what can people in 
Pakistan expect from the CPEC? Is the CPEC the only solution for all the problems of Pakistan, or is it one a, a helping hand or a crucial uh, aspect of Pakistan's uh, further development? You see, uh, as a, as, a, as someone who works on marketing Pakistan all the time, who works on investment related work for last 20, well, 15 odd years actually, at a leadership position. I look at three things when you when you invite someone for investment. Is what sort of narrative are you building? Whether, because if you read English newspaper and you, because an investor who does not understand Urdu, which is our local language, he will certainly read uh, uh, English newspaper or, or perhaps international uh, magazines and publications on, on our country. So when they read and when uh, and what what they were the kind of access to information that they had in 2013 to what they have now, I I, I think there's a huge gap in that, a huge improvement. I would say uh, today Pakistan and we are having this discussion on on CPEC, which is essentially an economic project, as opposed to having a discussion around security, which was the major discussion point around all think tanks in Pakistan in 2013s, you would imagine. And today now, not just for celebration purposes, even in any household discussion and where there is an economic agenda, uh, CPEC is one of the uh, one of the instrument that is discussed. But naturally it is not our economic agenda. It is a stimulus to our economic agenda. It can provide ec 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 electricity, it can provide infra road infrastructure which connects, as I said, farms to market. It can improve and provide technology and know-how of how this yield can be improved in, in farms, especially in areas where uh, and products where there is a there is a desire and scope in Chinese market. But overall improvement in, in the way to do business areas to do business and the industries to work on has to be done by us it cannot be uh, it cannot be an agenda which can be which is drawn by or crafted by chinese or any other country for us and if that was the case then us would have made our economic agenda in the last so many years you know and today we're talking about terrorism and we associate that with some of the aid that flew into and grants that flew into Pakistan, which was associated to, to terrorism and something that was happening in Afghanistan, isn't it? But today we are talking about investment flow coming from, from, um, from China and nothing else. And again, we are talking about investment of energy. And I always tell my friends from European Union and, and, uh, and, and US and one of our mutual friends that you refer to. I always say that, you know, the West realized the importance and potential and the incentives that were available in Pakistan since 2005, only when Chinese invested in Pakistan. And our risk profile for a country which was known for terrorism changed altogether for a country where you can invest not just in energy sector, but in hydrocarbon and and and, and agriculture and renewable in IT and services sector that you just mentioned. And this is what uh, CPAC did for us. We speak about Gawadar and its potential, uh, not just for uh, for providing logistic support, but also food support to as a part of supply chain to Central Asian countries and even in Afghanistan. So this is how, and wherever I go now and wherever our board of investment go and we have this discussion around investment attraction as part of our national agenda, CPEC is, is the poster boy, I would say, you know? Yeah. So this is, this is how CPEC helped. And when people say that it has not helped our poverty, I ask them, tell me per capita uh, access to uh, infrastructure, access to internet, access to clean drinking water in the past three years, because these are fundamental requirements for us to grow and, and say that we are a country uh, habitable, isn't it? These so are also that, basic those, human rights. The, absolutely. <laughs> so, well, and as if you follow Maslow's theory, 
you know, just this is this is the bottom uh, uh, stage which has to be, you know, and then comes the security and then comes the uh, affiliation followed by the last of self-acclimation. So once you uh, address the fundamental requirement which uh, CPEC is supporting us, and we have been exposed also in a way for net uh, in, in areas where though we have the potential, for example, the mining sector, the mines and mineral sector, where we have huge natural potential, huge natural endowment. But since CPEC has not provided stimulus there because we were not able to pitch our projects well, and now we are doing that, we were not able to get the kind of socioeconomic impact. Mm -hmm. And again, when you invest in agriculture and mining sector, the, the the aspect of poverty alleviation is addressed automatically. Yeah. So I, I I think I I this is one of those narratives about uh, around CPAC and around poverty alleviation which we have around Hambanputa and Gawadar also. Mm -hmm. So uh, so sometimes the reality on ground is different. I understand that we it could have been better if the if we could have had a, a clear charter of economy in terms of growing forward amongst all political stakeholders. And perhaps their, uh, their desire to, to have investment also, which is the agenda and political uh, manifesto of all, but also as ease of doing business as one of their agenda, which is now coming up. When Chinese meet our premier to people like us and also at a at tier at B2B level, they speak about their one window. Today we are studying Chinese one window. Today we are studying Viet, uh, Chinese investment in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Malaysia. So, and we want to attract that investment to our to our home ground also. So these are, I, I think, in terms of poverty alleviation, in terms of socioeconomic benefit, in terms of the debate around poverty and socioeconomic challenges have actually transformed because of this CPEC being a stimulus. Not yeah. only because of CPEC, but it being a stimulus. But also, I mean, this is a, a continuing process, but the potential yes. for the future is even greater. Uh, with the, as you said, we have the agriculture sector, you have the mining sector, you have the industrial sector. These are not fully developed in Pakistan, and these are also some of the bottlenecks because Af Pakistan imports a lot of its food needs, uh, which is a big uh, issue. It's not only a security problem, but it also drains the, the 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 currency reserves of the country. So these are that, these are know, things which uh, are, you know, something that is that you and I, as as our professional agenda, we work on. You know, we have about at this time 1.3 million people, young aspirant entering job market each year. So how can you provide them jobs unless you have special economic zones, unless you have industry, and unless you have projects where, irrespective of the sector, but projects where they can go and find employment, isn't it? So these, these projects and these initiatives by China gives us that hope. And this is the area, two areas where I would like to speak more on, on the intangible part is A, it provides us hope. Yes, that today we are moving in that direction, although we are moving slowly, but at least we are moving in a direction where we will be regionally integrated. And in a supply chain, you can't have a, an inefficient and inprofessional link chain as part of the overall chain of uh, activities. So to address that, we have to improve our, uh, our, our chain and that stands true for Afghanistan also. If the political agenda is to look after the poverty uh, and alleviate poverty of its people, they have to actually embrace projects like BRN and I'm happy that they're looking at it there. Yeah, we have a. Of course, we didn't discuss this uh, so much, and maybe this is a, a whole uh, subject for a whole uh, episode of podcast, like the strategic global importance of CPEC connectivity, as you said, in the region. You have the the you have the Arabian Sea, that Gwadar, and Pakistan could be a, a transport hub. We have also the energy supply uh, security question. Uh, I know this is a touchy issue, the Iran, Pakistan, India, gas pipeline. Uh, there were, has been discussions for decades uh, about the, these and also the extension of that into China, although that's a ph geographically, physically a bit more difficult 
So there are many, many benefits for connecting Pakistan to the region around it, but also to the global uh, infrastructure, transport, and uh, logistics hub. This is a completely, but uh, we just because of short of time, we, I mean, we covered a whole set, but I would like to ask you, what is your advice to the people in Europe, European countries, and uh, and Sweden, why should they go to Pakistan and invest in Pakistan? I think what I, I, and my my uh, uh, my request, uh, so to say, uh, would be a different tier. So on the leadership level, I think they should they should understand uh, Pakistan and its uh, and the potential that we have in Pakistan because of not just its geography, the natural endowment. We are, as you said, you know. Too large, uh, like France and Germany together, we are, uh, we are one, and and the potential, and and we are quite hospitable people. We are not as perhaps uh, some of the Western media projects. We're quite hospitable as part of our culture, Asian culture, and also the Middle East culture that we embrace uh, as part of our, uh, our background. So I, I I think uh, they should look at this uh, not in a not in a geopolitics um, framework but in a geoeconomic framework. Look at how in if China can transform the lives of more than eight hundred million people in less than thirty years, it is our right to do that. And then you have that instrument in front of us, which is a Chinese model. And I'm not saying the the political model. I'm saying the governance model. So the Western and European, I think they should look at this as, as a means of poverty elevation and how Pakistan can be an instrument for, because they look at, and I understand they have these values and ethical agenda of improving the livelihood across globe and even the environment. So by supporting Belt and Road Initiative, by supporting Pakistan, which has its tentacles across um, various regions from Iran to Afghanistan, to Central Asia, I think they would uh, support the region at large. Now at people le people's level, at ordinary people level, which are which would listen to you or perhaps your student, I think they should understand Pakistanis uh, more. They should talk and uh, discuss and read our history more. We've been impacted by terrorism, which is which was not domestic, which was which was from outside and under the agenda of some other regions and countries. And it is. It this is not. Uh, uh, this is not new. This has been there historically also. So I think you interact and remember we have youth, which can speak fluent English. I mean fluent in terms of interaction. I'm not saying as good as as uh, native, but they can understand and speak English, and that is our biggest um, potential moving forward in the e-commerce and IT sector because we speak English. We it's it's our official language and we teach English in our schools and colleges and higher education institutions. Okay. Uh, the third thing on terms of uh, European Union and perhaps also our friends and colleagues uh, in Europe and in US, I think they should look at Belt and Road Initiative because of its economic potential and not what it offers to China, but what it offers to us developing countries in Africa and here. So while there, there may be a political agenda which they look at, but they should also look at, at the socioeconomic potential that it has. And if Europe joins this overall scheme of economic growth and development, if they can join together under Paris Agreement for Environment, why can't they join together under an agreement where they can have their initiative linked to Belt and Road Initiative? And that could be a larger... Uh, agenda for human interaction and growth. Yeah. Well, very good. I mean, one of the things we, we ourselves have learned is that uh, to know a country, you should travel there. I think uh, you should encourage people from Europe and other parts of the world to travel to Pakistan. It's a beautiful country. I was planning to travel to Pakistan before the COVID-19 broke out, but I'm looking forward to visiting your country. It's fantastic. I've seen uh, people who travel there telling their stories, showing the pictures, what they have seen. So it's a very good way of learning about uh, the other country. But uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, it has been very, very uh, informative and uh, enjoyable to discuss the CPEC 10 years uh, with you. And uh, looking forward to meeting you in future. Thank you. Thank you.
Episode. Thank you for uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hussain Askri. And I think our next uh, discussion should be uh, involving maybe um, some European and maybe US experts and discussing about economic agenda and not just around this, but perhaps around the challenges towards globalization. Exactly. Yeah, we're looking forward to organize new webinars to invite more people. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, we will have more information on uh, our work on the, the CPEC uh, from our website in the description of this video. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.